uh, a very warm welcome to everybody to our Zoom and Coffee with William Bell, and it's uh, organized by Commitment for Life. There will be breakout rooms a little bit later on. Um, I'm going to be asking Charlotte uh, to introduce William in the moment. Just before Charlotte does that, we're going to ask Suzanne Pearson to open up in prayer. Um, but let's, I just wanted to show you this wonderful quote from William, and to, just to think on this to, to, to kind of frame uh, a, a lot of what's going, uh, or, or what hopefully we're going to be talking about today. We are clear that the building blocks for a meaningful peace will be found in the pursuit of justice and an end to the indignity of occupation. The world must not choose who is more deserving and privilege one over the other. Let us pray. God of peace, we gather today in peace for the sake of peace. We hear of wars and rumours of wars, both new and ancient. We ask that you encourage, uplift and bless those who seek a fair and just peace throughout the world, but especially in Palestine and Israel. Above all, Give us courage to be like Jesus, that we may be strengthened to care for everyone in need until the coming of the light of the, into the world. Amen. And amen. Charlotte, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce William, and uh, I want to thank him so much for, for coming to speak to us all. Um, no doubt I will learn as much as you do, if not more. Um, William uh, is our, our fantastic um, head of Middle East policy and advocacy at Christian Aid, uh, all of which is a long title to say uh, that he is our, our expert on what Christian Aid is doing and what our kind of policies and positions are, are on the Middle East. But he's also just the person who always knows what's happening and who, um, who fantastically edits a lot of the stuff that I write that you get um, in your Commitment for Life updates to, to make them much more precise uh, and, and really fair. So uh, William, please, over to you, please do tell us more about this uh, fantastic report and what we can do to get involved. I have no doubt we will learn a lot. Thank you, Charlotte and Kevin. And it's always hard. It's a, that's a hard, hard introduction to live up to. Um, I hope I don't disappoint. It's always great, though, to be with the United Reformed Church because it feels um, possibly more than any other church. I'm really with friends. So it's great. Um, so thank you very much for um, taking the time today to come along and listen. And before I talk about the report, um, I, I just want to sort of re remember a moment and share it with you from the early 2000s when I started at Christian Aid um, and I went to Gaza for the first time um, and met with some, the, someone now who is a very old friend 20 years later but who was the first time I met um, and when I came into the room of his office in the Palestinian Agricultural Relief Committee who Commitment for Life had been supporting for many years through Christian Aid he produced from under the desk what I can only describe as a bulging sack and it was a sack of postcards from people all over the UK, from the URC, who had written in solidarity. Um, and the smile on his face and everybody else who, who was in the office from, um, the, the, from Park, from the, 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 the partner that Commitment for Life was supporting, was just amazing. And it just demonstrated so much how much it meant to people to have that solidarity, to, to have that knowledge that there are people in the UK that were thinking about the people in Gaza and, and in solidarity with them. It was so important and it meant so much to them. So I just thought I would share that with you because it's, I think, um, it's good to know that people you know, do really appreciate those, you know, however small an act it is, actually it has a big impact on those who, who receive it. Um, I'm gonna now share my screen um, Hopefully this went really well in the in just a moment ago. So I'm going to try it again. Here we go. It does seem to be working. Let me let me know if you can't see it. So this was a report that it 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 we released this um, last year, and it was in a way an opportunity for Christian Aid to update. And I'm going to try and time myself so I don't talk for more than 20 minutes. So bear with me a second. So as I said, this this report, Where is Palestine? Um, a story of loss, failure, and or inequality, loss and failure, um, was was published um, in the autumn last year. And there was an opportunity for us to update our analysis um, and to sort of present where we felt 
the, the situation between Israel and, and the Palestinians is now. We, we've, we've, we periodically do produce reports that gives people hopefully an idea of the reality on the ground and stories from the ground. And we felt that it was long overdue. Um, and why did we call it Where is Palestine? Well, because what we also wanted to do with this report was provide a snapshot of Palestinians and their and their situation now compared to you know, roughly 25 years ago when the Oslo Accord was um, signed between um, the Israeli government and the and the PLO um, and that was about um, a process that by the end of the decade by 2000 should have led to the two-state solution it should have led to um, the the the, what we think of as the occupied West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, or East, yeah, East Jerusalem as um, yeah, the, the, the Palestinian state with Israel um, on, the, on the remainder of the land as, a, as another sovereign state. But of course, we know that didn't happen. And so we felt that it was important to ask, yeah, well, well, where is it? Where is Palestine? Because clearly there is a place that Palestinians think of as Palestine. And at the time, people imagined that that out of that process, we would um, now, or uh, well, Palestinians at least, would be enjoying a sovereign state exercising the right to self-determination. But clearly that's not the case. And so we sort of have to ask ourselves, why not? And that's what I hope this report tries to do. And I'm gonna provide a little bit of a snapshot through this slideshow, but obviously um, if you get the opportunity to read the report, um, it gives you a, a bit more opportunity to go into more detail. And, and being an online resource, we also took advantage of the fact that we wanted to produce something relatively short, but that if you wanted to do further reading, it would be easy to do so. So a lot of the footnotes are live hyperlinks that can take you to other places which we sourced some of the data from that goes into more detail about particular issues. Um, so please do have a read of it if you have, if you have the time. Um, why, why does Palestine still not exist? Um, well, for us, there are sort of three three main reasons and one of them is the culture of impunity that exists um, throughout the, the occupied territory another is the sort of the, the political corruption um, and the other is the lack of international political will um, and and the report goes through all of that but it looks at particular issues that confront palestinians so it looks at um, issues of, of, of access to water. It looks at the phenomenon of settlements. It looks at the level of, levels of settler violence. It looks at the rate of home demolitions and it looks at the Palestinian economy. So it sort of compares GDP, employment, et cetera, from, from before. Um, and we also, yeah, in terms of the, of the front cover, I mean, many of you will be familiar with this poster, Visit Palestine, um, because it's actually, um, a, a well, there's a mural on the wall um, near Bethlehem, but of course it's a copy of a 1930s um, poster that was developed by um, the precursor to the World Zionist Organization, encouraging, encouraging European Jews to visit the then British Mandate of Palestine. Um, so it's a it's a poster that's sort of full of of really you know, loaded with lots of his, historical nuance um, and. What we hope is it gets people to think a little bit. Um, I'm going to start here because I think it's an important place. Um, it's not a not a nice um, place, but I think it, it is part of the reality. Um, and it speaks for itself. And I guess the question that I, I would always want to ask is, um, you know, th these figures only go in one direction at the moment. Um, and you know, back in May last year, we were painfully aware of, of more being added. And this, th this, these figures do include um, the last um, outbreak of violence in May that um, was most, most um, tragically felt in Gaza, but actually there was violence that broke out throughout um, Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. And perhaps for the first time in a way that Israelis hadn't experienced themselves, within some of the mixed cities like Lod um, and others inside of Israel, where there was a real sense of the Palestinian citizens of Israel feeling, um, yeah, expressing their sense of frustration at, at being second-class citizens. Um, obviously, the, the, well, as, not obviously, but many of you will be aware that that, uh, that violence broke out in, in, in Gaza and the rest of, of IOPT. Um, 
partly because of what was happening in East Jerusalem in Sheikh Jarrah. And that, that is an area of East Jerusalem where um, Palestinian homes are being, um, Palestinians are being forced to leave their homes to make way for um, uh, Israeli settlers. Um, and that's being facilitated through the courts um, inside of Israel. So that's what sparked off um, that that round of violence. There was also, um, some of you may remember, a, 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 a storming of the Al-Aqsa uh, mosque compound um, by the Israeli military because they claimed that there'd been Palestinians who'd been throwing um, uh, homemade weapons and bombs down at the, well, not bombs, but homemade um, weapons at, at um, um, Jewish Israelis praying in the wall beneath um, the, the compound. Um, and, and, and I think one of the really interesting sort of recognitions long overdue, and it was reported in the, the Jewish, uh, it, well, both in the Jewish Chronicle, but, but primarily in The Guardian by Jonathan Friedland, where he recognized um, that it is the status quo um, that continually leads us back to this place of violence um, that leads to, to these sorts of figures. Um, and I think that's a really important point to recognize that if we do nothing, if the international community does not change the reality on the ground, however difficult, sensitive and painful that may be, if I was to do this um, presentation again in the near future, those figures would have only gone up. Um, just as a quick reminder for those who are unfamiliar about the, the, the layout of the land, we often assume that we all know what we're talking about by West Bank and Gaza and the occupied territories, but hopefully this, these maps are, are self-explanatory. Um, the two maps that uh, 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 demonstrate um, in different detail the occupation. Um, so the, the, the one on the right, the West Bank today, the, the dark brown areas, um, which represents uh, uh, the, the, the just under the half of the uh, actual occupied territory of the West Bank are those Palestinian built up areas where you'll find the main urban centers. But the, the gray areas are under full Israeli control and they will be where you will find the settlements, but also the military firing zone and areas also which Israel has declared as nature reserves. And you will find um, uh, Palestinians living in these areas, but they live in really precarious situation and often adjacent to um, Israeli settlements. And sometimes the only way that those Palestinians um, are able to stay on their land is by um, electing to work in nearby Israeli settlements. So it's a bit of a Hobson's choice. They either, in a sense, um, um, uh, you know, help strengthen the presence of the settlements by working in them and making them more economically viable, or they accept that there is no way for them to earn a living um, and move to the urban areas. This is particularly true of the area north of Jericho um, in the Jordan Valley, which is an area where there is um, mile upon mile upon mile of huge, um, essentially Israeli plantations, which are um, sort of, if you like, the breadbasket of the, of the Israeli settler movement and where most of the, the fresh produce that you would find um, on, in, in European shops comes from. Um, but you will also find Palestinian villages who are pretty much at a subsistence level um, within, within and between some of those settlements as well. Um, I'm going to just quickly talk a little bit about Gaza because I think Gaza um, is in a really, you know, it, it, it warrants a special mention because of the blockade that has been going on for more than 15 years now. Um, of all of the parts of the occupied territories that are um, in, in the, that are, that are most in need of aid um, and, and humanitarian assistance, it would be in Gaza, where as, as, as is demonstrated, 80% of the population um, of, of just over 2 million are dependent on some form of aid um, and, and almost half are unemployed. And when, when you look at the under 30s, the youth, that, actually, that figure actually goes up. And most of the young people, certainly anybody under the age of about 16, they will never have left the Gaza Strip. And this is a piece of land that is approximately the size of the Isle of Wight. And so they have no, other than through their smartphones, um, they have no sense of what the outside world looks like. Um, and, and of course, not even the, the, you know, the West Bank or even Jerusalem. Um, 
the lucky few, and I, I use that word um, uh, semi-ironically, might have been to Jerusalem or the West Bank if they were severely ill enough in order to be given a permit to um, visit a hospital um, that um, was providing treatment that's not, a, not, not um, available um, in such as cancer treatment um, and some sort of forms of kidney dialysis and other sort of critical diseases, which is not available um, inside the Gaza Strip. Um, Gaza is a, a really difficult place to visit, partly because it is actually just really difficult to get to because of the, the, sort of the permit system and the, and the way in which Israel and to a degree Egypt have it hermetically sealed. So it, it, it requires some effort and the only people who can would be either um, uh, diplomats, um, reporters, uh, journalists, or, or, or aid workers such as ourselves. So um, we go in fairly regularly as, as part of our monitoring and, and support to the partners that we have inside of Gaza. This is unfortunately a, 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 this is an unfortunate image because, of course, we've probably more recently used to seeing this type of image coming out of Ukraine, but this actual image was from 2014 in Gaza, um, which was one of the worst outbreaks of violence that the Strip um, had um, experienced. And indeed, many of the people who were made homeless from um, uh, explosions like this are still homeless. Um, so it, it, the situation for the people on the ground is, is pretty desperate. Um, and, and I think, you know, especially given that it's something that we all talk about much more now, thankfully, it, I think you sort of it, you, you can imagine the mental health of a population that um, you know, exists in this environment. Um, and whilst I think that, that the primary responsibility does remain with Israel as the occupying power, and as the UN has said, as as it, it is the occupying power, given that it controls the air, sea, and border crossings and the population registry, that's not to to sort of so to speak, let off the hook, the, the, um, the Palestinian Authority in charge, Hamas, who are um, also responsible for some levels of suffering there and, and for not prioritizing um, the, the need to support the population in, in, as, in, as, in as much, you know, in, in the way that they should. Um, it, it is a desperate place. Um, yeah, an example of uh, sort of the mental health issues. Uh, I actually took this picture myself when I went in in 2014, just literally um, days after the violence had ended. And I remember not far from here, um, bumping into a, a, a man who was sort of basically wandering around um, looking um, unsurprisingly, um, yeah, lost. Um, and, and his only words words to me were that he wished that he died with the others because they had a quick death. Um, in other words, he, he but it's self-explanatory, but for him, the quality of life being left in Gaza where at that stage, electricity was was down to one or two hours a day. It's, it's you know, now it, it, is, it is much higher, but it's still not 24 hours a day. Um, and obviously the, the economic situation is even worse in the, in the years since um, that attack. And if any figure of the demonstrates the, the you know why why Palestine doesn't exist, you know why that um, hope that came with the, the Oslo Accord back in '93, and the and why a Palestinian state doesn't exist now on 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 in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, it's this figure, um, and I'm going to read it out, even though it's there for you to see, but I just think it's 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 extraordinary that. There were a quarter of a million settlers in illegal settlements, which our government, the US government at least then, and everybody else recognized as illegal under international law. Um, it was assumed, I think, that there might be um, some land swaps within the, uh, to be negotiated by the partners, by the, sorry, not by the partners, by both parties. Um, uh, but it was a quarter of a million. Today, it, it is more than 650,000. So, that's an, an extraordinary leap in numbers. Um, throughout that time, um, regular um, tenders have gone out, approved by a succession of Israeli prime ministers for um, settlement expansion. More houses have been built and more Israelis have been tempted to live there, partly because ideologically they want to be there, but the vast majority because 
it makes economic sense for them to be there because if they wanted to, you know, assuming they were living in, you know, working in either Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, um, where the, the, the cost of property is not dissimilar to here, um, they could have at the fraction of the cost, a pretty nice detached house or a spacious apartment um, in, in a settlement which is linked up infrastructurally with raid, with road, um, and, um, et cetera, to the big cities. So they become like suburbs and banal suburbs at that, where certainly if you were to go into any of the settlements in East Jerusalem, they won't even refer to them as settlements. And I think for the majority, they don't, they lit, they do not think of them as settlements. They will talk about them as neighborhoods of Jerusalem. Um, but nevertheless, under international law, they are um, illegal. Um, but that I think that figure demonstrates a lot um, the the distance that we still have to go to reach that aspiration of um, you know two states for for two people. This is um, quite a nice picture in the sense that it you know represents a nice a nice looking town, but the reality is it is one of those illegal settlements um, with a municipal swimming pool, all the services that you would expect, um, and in the distance. Um, that you probably can't quite make out um, are Palestinian villages um, that uh, do not have, um, unsurprisingly, any of the sorts of level of services that um, a settlement like this clearly enjoys. Um, um, and again, I think if if things you know if we need to look at how things have got worse, this is a really I think interesting measure. So just to, to read it out, in two thousand and six. Um, and these figures um, came from a mixture of the Betzalem, um, our partner, the Israeli human rights partner, Betzalem, um, and the UN. So in 2006, there were 49 Palestinians' home destroyed, were destroyed um, by the Israeli military for not having the right permit, which is notoriously difficult for Palestinians to, to uh, both apply for and then um, successfully get. Um, but in 2021, the figure had risen to 160, um, which is a pretty steep um, increase. Um, but the total number of houses, homes, this isn't the total number of um, buildings, this is just people's homes that were destroyed has been 1,833, um, which obviously created quite a lot of homelessness, people having to, to move um, sometimes, especially in some of the remote areas, um, uh, villages, whole villages. And that's what it looks like. Um, it's, 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 it's shocking for Palestinians to see their, their homes to be destroyed. What's even more shocking is that sometimes um, they will destroy the houses themselves because the Israeli state will charge them for this. Um, and so it is cheaper for them to actually destroy them themselves. Um, and the reasons that Israel won't give them permits is because they, it, well, the reason that, the, that, that Israel destroys them is, be, is because that they don't have um, the right building regulations. They don't have the the right permit, which, as I said, is pretty pretty you know not impossible, especially in Area C for Palestinians to get. Area C is that big grey area that I, I showed you in the in that West Bank map earlier on. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, refugees as well. This is deliberately, as a presentation, a snapshot of the Palestinian experience across the board, um, as much as it's possible to do that. Um, Whilst a lot of our work focuses on Palestinian communities inside the West Bank um, and Gaza and East Jerusalem, because that's um, where an awful lot of the poverty exists, um, we do also work with, um, and as I'll come on to a little bit at the end, with organizations that work um, with Palestinian citizens of Israel, particularly the Bedouin in the, um, the Negev or the Nakab in the, in the south. But we also work in Lebanon, um, but in, in, in the ter occupied territories as well, with a lot of the refugee communities. And I just think it's important to, to remember that out of the approximately 10 million Palestinians that exist globally, um, over half, you know, over half of those are actually registered as refugees, and many of those living in camps across the Middle East, and perhaps none in worse conditions, at least until the civil war in Syria broke out, um, than in um, in Lebanon. Uh, I realise I've been twenty minutes. I'll probably be another five if that's okay with everybody. Um, 
And I just think it's, again, it's important to remember that these camps, these refugee camps were built in 1948 to accommodate those Palestinians that were either forced to leave or fleeing the war of 1948 that um, saw the creation of the State of Israel, but what Palestinians will refer to um, as the Nakba. Um, and Shatila camp, which is infamous as being also the, the, the site of the um, the massacre in 1982 of Palestinian refugees, but it was built in 40, 1949 for 3,000 refugees. And that today, in exactly the same space, because it's the same area of land that has been leased from the Lebanese government to the UN, um, to UNRWA, to, to, to support the, um, you know, the health and education and, and, and housing needs of Palestinian refugees. Um, today, there are more than 20,000 living in the same space. Many of those, much of that increase in recent years is down to Palestinian refugees and to a certain degree Syrian refugees fleeing the civil war in um, uh, Syria. And um, really alarmingly as well, more recently, some Lebanese have moved into the camps as the economic situation in um, Lebanon has deteriorated so much, rather than be homeless on the streets, they've sought refuge in the refugee camps in order to be able to access some of the services. Um, this is just a, gives you a sense of, of what the sort of the, the streets and alleyways look like in um, the refugee camps. Um, this actually is not too bad, but um, some of them are much worse than this. Um, those, those leads you see are a mixture of electricity and water pipes. Um, and the number one killer in most of the, the camps nowadays in Lebanon um, is actually electric shocks, because this is all electricity that has basically been tapped into electrical supplies outside of the camp. Um, and as I said earlier, the size of the camp, um, the circumference of the camp hasn't changed. But of course, building has to go on to accommodate the numbers and it just goes up and up and up. Um, and as I said, the number one killer is um, electric shocks. So what, is, what, is, what do we do? Um, well, number one, we stand in solidarity, um, as I think we, we all should, with those who you are, um, you know, don't have access to justice, who are poor through no uh, means, through no fault of their own, and who, you know, require assistance, um, whether that's for us to speak out with them or on behalf of them, um, not to take sides in the sense of, you know, we we're pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli. That that isn't any help to anybody. Um, and and Palestinians and Israelis will often those, and especially those in the in the in the peace movements, will 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 tell you the same. It's it's about being pro-justice. It's about being pro-equality. Um, and for us as an organisation. Um, you've heard me talk a little bit earlier about the, the, the two state solution. Um, we don't support um, a, any particular, um, uh, you know, either a one state solution or a two state solution. That's very much for the parties to negotiate, but they must be able to negotiate that as equals um, and with Im you know, impartial mediation from the international community. Um, we do support support community resilience through our, our partners um, in the in the particularly in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, um, and and Gaza. We provide humanitarian assistance, especially um, in times of violent conflict, um, and we defend and promote human rights. And as elsewhere in the world, we do this through local organisations. They're the people who know best. So we have a network of uh, Palestinian and Israeli partners who we are guided by, who we, as far as possible, we also core funds to help strengthen them as organizations. Um, just a few examples of the sorts of work that those partners do. Um, this is uh, the Culture and Free, Free Thought Association, which runs um, uh, centers for, for children in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. To some extent, it sort of supplements an overstretched educational system run by the UN, but it also does much more than that. It provides psychosocial care and it provides alternatives for young people who otherwise might be tempted into a future dominated by violence. So it, it sort of it teaches leadership skills, it provides um, people with sort of peace resolution skills as well, as much for within their own community um, as for the, the, the wider. Um, conflict as well. Um, we support the Young Women's Christians Association based in East Jerusalem, and that supports, again, young people to um, 
develop uh, a sense of dignity and opportunity to think about an alternative future than the one that they currently have. Um, and we support wherever possible communities to develop their and, and to support them to implement their own um, solutions to particular problems, um, whether that be um, in this case in Gaza or across the West Bank. Um, just again, a bit more of an example of one of our partners in Raboud in the West Bank. Um, we also support, as I mentioned, um, human rights organizations, both Palestinian and Israeli. Um, so Betzalem, that many of you will be familiar with, are uh, one of the primary um, Israeli human rights organizations that document all human rights violation um, and and also act in solidarity with Palestinians in trying to achieve justice. So they engage in a lot of international advocacy. We also support a lot of Palestinian human rights organizations who try um, and engage with some of the international instruments like the International Criminal Court to um, address the issue of either war crimes or crimes against humanity. Um, and there is um, a forthcoming investigation, which of course the Israeli state are not happy with that will be looking at um, all such crimes, whether committed by Israel or the Palestinians um, in the in the occupied territories, but it's still um, a way off from becoming a reality. And unfortunately for us in this country, it's one that for some reason, um, which I don't really understand, the British government refuses to support. Um, we also support um, the ecumenical accompaniment um, program in Palestine and Israel, which is part of the World Council of Churches response to the situation. Um, many of you will be familiar with EAPPI, but they provide um, a, a really important um, um, witness presence and also solidarity presence. And that could be anything from, as you can see here, escorting young kids to, to school, but also to, to monitor the behavior of um, the Israeli military at checkpoints, particularly between um, difficult um, but very busy crossing points such as Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Um, this is an example of uh, one of our Israeli partners who work with um, the uh, Palestinian minority inside of Israel, not least those of, uh, those of who are trying to remain on their land um, in villages that even predate the state of Israel in the Negev, which are being cleared by Israel um, against the population's will. Um, and this is a, just a sort of a, an example of um, some of the work that we've been doing supporting people through the, the COVID experience, um, but also sort of rebuilding some of the infrastructure that, that, that clearly will be um, damaged or destroyed in any outbreak of violence. Um, this is just some of the, uh, an example of some of the sorts of, of, of um, outreach that we do with trying to get people to either act or, or to inform people about what's going on, um, which I think is really important. Um, yeah, it's, it's another, another mural um, from the wall, and I think it sort of speaks for itself. Um, many of you will recognize it as, yeah, as Banksy. Um, and this, I think, is just the last point, so, and I'll leave this with yeah. us all. Um, and it's about how we can help Palestinians and Israelis to live as equals, in dignity, and with justice, applied to all without privilege. And how do we honor and respect them? And how do we love them both? And that, that is the main challenge to all of us in, you know, in ways big and small. How do we love them both? And how do we treat them um, as equals and honor, with honor and respect? And I will stop there and open up to any questions. I need to stop sharing. Here we go. Thank you. That's, that's um, so much to absorb there. And so much to, I'm, I, I, I'm wondering if we could go into some breakout rooms just for a while so that we, in smaller groups we can just try to, to process some of the things you've given. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, put uh, people into breakout rooms and ask them to, um, to formulate a question from the group for you. So let's let's do it that way. Uh, each, so so what I'm asking everybody to do is to is to is to discuss what you've heard and together as a group formulate a question that we can then put into the chat for you. So I'm going to open up those breakout rooms for us to go into. Just remember to unmute yourself when you go into those, uh, and we'll see you back um, in a while. Organisations. 
which referred to Israel. Um, it, 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 they all use slightly different language, um, but 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 essentially are accusing Israel of either being an apartheid regime or guilty of um, crimes of apartheid or crime of apartheid. And by that, they mean the crime of persecution, the, the cri war crimes and crimes against humanity um, and aggression. Um, and they all, I think, um, demonstrate in one way or another how this that that, that Israel is you know, and they're not trying and they deliberately and they all make this point they're not this is not about trying to find um comparisons sorry they're not trying to find comparisons um or likenesses per se with South Africa, but this is about the UN Convention Against Apartheid, um, apartheid being a crime under international law. And they look at the, the issue of, well, they all looked at the, at the realities of when you have Palestinians and Israelis living alongside each other and conclude that in each case, whether you're talking about within East Jerusalem, in the West Bank, um, inside of Israel itself, um, or, or in Gaza, um, that uh, there is either privilege um, for the Jewish Israeli population or um, clear discrimination or persecution based on identity um, and ethnic or racial identity. Um, clearly, Israel disputes this, and primarily they will they will point to certainly you know uh, which is which is not untrue that inside of Israel, obviously unlike South Africa, um, Palestinians are allowed to vote and indeed are represented in the current um, coalition government. But they demonstrate that there are instances of systematic discrimination that exist in terms of opportunity, in terms of uh, benefits, etc that exist inside of Israel for the citizens of Israel, that, that it is not an equal society, even if it is not as unequal as the South African um, version of apartheid that we're more familiar with. Obviously that changes dramatically when you go into the West Bank, where you have um, a Palestinian population of approximately two, over 2 million, 2.6 million. And as I said earlier, 650,000 Israeli settlers. And here I'm talking about including East Jerusalem as part of the West Bank. And quite clearly um, and unequivocally, the two live, to, live under very different systems. All Israelis, regardless of whether they are settlers in the occupied territory or in Israel itself, uh, uh, live under Israeli civilian law. Palestinians who live in the same area uh, exist either uh, under nominal Palestinian authority rule in areas A, in the built up areas, but where Israel has the right to pursuit should it want to, but in areas, or, but through all the way through to areas B and then C, where there's different um, elements of control. But Israel, but Palestinians will be subject to Israeli military law. Um, so there's a very you know, there's a dual system of law based on identity, based on who you are, and and for refugees, as Amnesty would say, you know they have no right to return to the places in which their, they or their, their, their forebears came from in the way that Israel's law of return, the basic law, allows um, anybody of Jewish descent to move to Israel. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, those, those are facts. Now, whether you want to call that apartheid, Christian Aid is not an organization that has um, a legal department or, or does the sort of levels of legal analysis that either Human Rights Watch or Amnesty do. So we've chosen at the moment to, to, to not actually come out publicly and say, yes, we, we agree this is apartheid, because actually what we feel is more important for us to do is to not actually get caught up in, in that sort of legal language, but actually what we think it's more important to do is to show people the reality of human existence at, at, the, at the grassroots level. And then you can make up your own mind. You might want to call it apartheid. You might want to call it something else. But are you happy with that? Are you happy with those levels of inequality? Are we, are we, are we prepared to accept the levels of discrimination, the, the levels of poverty, which really do not need to exist? Um, I think we should be personally responding to that human tragedy, that human story, rather than only responding to it 
because of the legal name that one gives it. I, I totally accept that under international law, if, if Israel is guilty of apartheid, that that creates an obligation within the international community to respond, and to act, and that level of accountability is very important. But first and foremost, and especially given who we are, we should be morally outraged. Um, we should be acting because it is wrong for people to be living under that level of inequality and under those sorts of conditions. We shouldn't accept that, um, regardless of what we call it. The second part of the question is rather more difficult with this group because the URC has actually you know, uh, been a pioneer in, in, in the way in which it's responded to the Sabil Kairos um, campaign for investing in peace or investing for peace, the, the morally responsible investment campaign. Um, and, and as a church, has introduced um, the, 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 the screening proposals that, that Sabil Kairos campaigned for, and which we now, and the report was the first sort of instance where we publicly came out in support of it, we now also support that, that morally responsible investment campaign. So in a way, as a church, you are already leading the way and doing something um, incredibly important, because I think you know, if, there's one, if there's one thing that we are able to do as individuals, as consumers, as uh, civil society, is to not accept the normalization of, for example, settlements or occupation. So why should we accept them as part of pension portfolios or investment portfolios or in our, in our procurement policies? We should be ensuring that those companies that openly trade with settlements or that those companies that, that, that market goods from those settlements you know, are, are not able to profit from it. It should be unacceptable. Um, so I think it's more of that. And more than anything else, it is sharing the stories that you hear either through Commitment for Life or, 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 the, or other, you know, other avenues that Christian Aid shares for um, stories in. So yeah, that, I mean, as I said, uh, the URC is, is, a, is ahead, of the, ahead of the game on this one, but um, it is more of that. And you know, until those economic measures uh, begin to bite, you know, the extreme example of where we're seeing how economic measures are having hopefully some impact, which has not stopped the war yet, but, but the, the Russian government has clearly made it clear that sanctions are hurting. So sanctions can and do work. Um, and I think that um, that should be, the way to go. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a legitimate non-violent response to an illegal act. So I, I hope that goes some way to to explain or to to respond to those questions. Thank you, thank you, William. There, there's some really fantastic questions out there. I'm just trying to see if any of them kind of can be uh, joined together to ask them. Um, um, that that form similar themes, if you like. Emma's doing a very helpful job of of, yeah. of embellishing my responses. So listen to Emma as well, because she's <laughs> Emma's she's the... she's on the ball there. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I I think what's what is absolutely clear to say. So let's sort of let's let's come back a bit first before yeah. dealing with the, with with EAPI. I think what it's really clear. Um, to say is that the Israeli government, this one and the one before it, are concerned with civil society, whether it be Israeli, Palestinian or international. The way in which they've responded to, for example, um, the six Palestinian organizations like al Haq and others that have been responsible for monitoring human rights violations and then presenting that the, those facts on the ground, which people don't dispute, um, to the International Criminal Court is very, very telling. And um, for those who aren't aware, Al Haq, who were a former partner of Christian Aid, um, were one of those um, Palestinian organizations that really were, were responsible for the International Criminal Court agreeing um, that that the that, 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 that there is a case to to respond to, um, and that should be an, there should be an investigation. So Israel, it would seem to me, is closing down that civil society space um, where there is um, an exposure of. Uh, human rights violations or breaches to international law. So it's sort of a process, if you like, of, of discrediting 
those organizations that provide that information, making it very difficult for the, the civil society organizations that you would expect to support any investigation, um, but also delegitimizing that voice in, in, in with, it, with, with, for example, donors. Um, luckily, you know, you, we have the likes of the Irish government who still fund bilaterally um, some of those on that list. Um, and the European Union, I think, has, has not been as equivocal, but has also, I think, questioned this, whether there's really any substance to the, the Israeli accusations. Um, so I think that, that clearly the Israeli government's actions have been successful to an extent, but I don't think that they, in the end, will triumph, even if um, along the way they will cause real difficulty. With the ecumenical accompanies, it's quite difficult to know exactly where we're at with them, because of course, until the last literally couple of months, there have been no EAs going over to the occupied territories because of COVID. Um, we know that before COVID, um, that there were certain areas where EAs were finding it increasingly difficult to, to continue, such as Hebron, where there'd been a real backlash um, from the settlers, which you know, had not been, you know, there'd been no useful intervention by the, by the Israeli military presence, maybe unsurprisingly, to any of the hostility that, that was directed towards the, the EAs. Um, I, I suspect that it is only a matter of time before Israel finds um, a way to making it more and more difficult um, for EAs to, to go over and do what they have been doing. Um, whether they'll be able to make it illegal or not, I don't know. That will be quite a challenge. Um, and it will, it will be interesting to see how, if that does happen, the World Council of Churches responds to that, because that will be really quite a statement to, to not allow um, presence and witness presence from um, essentially a you know, the international church community. I, I I'm not sure whether they'll maybe 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 they maybe they will be um, become an illegal presence, but I, I I'm not aware that yet um, that is exactly what's happening. But but in terms of frustrating their presence, then yes, absolutely. Excellent, thank you. And um, I've just Hillary has just put a question about um, um, the the UK government refuses to question the Israeli evidence on the six CSOs. I think I'd need you to explain what that is. Uh, it says it's an internal matter for Israel. Could you comment on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, in a sense, um, Hillary has 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 sort of answered the question um, herself, which is the UK government, and I, you know, when. Christian Aid and, and others within the um, NGO sector um, as part of a UK Palestine NGO platform have taken this up with James Cleverly, who we would have yearly meetings or twice yearly meetings with as the 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 you know the, N, the UK NGO community operating inside the occupied territories. Um, we we did bring this issue up for him, and that was the response that we got. He wasn't going to be drawn on um, whether or not the evidence. Um, was substantial enough to warrant what Israel has done. Um, and that is pretty much always the response of the UK government um, to not give a substantial response. I mean, it's, it's, it's odd because on the one hand, the UK government accepts that the settlements are illegal. Its policy is that the, the, the settlements are unlawful. Um, they have regular feedback from the consulates based in East Jerusalem about developments in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, they they even on Twitter talk about um, and with, uh, present pictures of themselves witnessing that destruction, which I think is extraordinary that they acknowledge what they're witnessing, but then don't follow up with any um, actual actions. Yeah. Um, so the UK government is a really hard nut to crack at the, on this one at the moment. One could all, you know, we could draw, we'll draw all sorts of, of, of conclusions as to why that might be. I'm quite sure that um, the desire to have a, a speedy um, trade relationship with Israel post Brexit um, figures in, within that. I think we also all know that there are many within the current UK government that have have always been very pro Israel, and therefore this is an opportunity for them to to demonstrate that. Um, 
I, 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 but, but this is a challenge. This is a massive challenge. And some of you might remember that back in May last year, when we had the e-action, which was asking that the, the Prime Minister, um, Boris Johnson, do all within his power to exercise political leverage to achieve help to achieve a, a ceasefire. The second part of that was about um, changing and challenging the status quo. And, and one of the ways that we saw that the UK government could do that would be to reverse its stated position that currently opposes the ICC investigation mm. um, because it deems it to be um, partisan and partial, wow. which I think is at odds with the speed with which it um, calls um, for President, um, or Prime Minister, President Putin to be brought before the um, ICC in the case of Ukraine, which I, I think is a good call, but why the difference? And I think we really need to ask ourselves, you know, if, if that, why is it that, that you know, if, whether it's an ally or not, why is it that we don't consider that if we, if we can see and we accept and we witness that illegal acts are happening and by whoever in the occupied territory, why do we not want to bring the same um, you know, the pressure to bear on those um, that are guilty of, of, of those crimes, or at least to investigate whether those, uh, whether the people have been guilty of the crimes of which they're accused. It seems to me odd, um, but that's where we currently are. So it's really difficult um, to, to, you know, with the UK government on this one. So it doesn't surprise me that they would, you know, they would say this is an internal matter that I, I, I I, I think that's a cop-out answer, personally, but um, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that they 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 re respond like that. Yeah, um, and um, we can see your cat reflected in the uh, in the in the picture to to your left. Obviously, agreeing with what you're saying. I always <laughs> love it to see a cat on Zoom. I, I love. It. Um, and I think just on that, I think you kind of touched on Ian's question around raising public awareness about the injustice in Palestine in the light of the concern of, of Ukraine at the moment. I think what you said kind of touches on that. Yeah. And also, um, maybe something, uh, maybe Hillary is more asking a hope about a, a, the prospect of a better result from the new minister of the Middle East, Amanda Milling. Yeah, I, I mean, we, yeah, I, 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 a good question, which I don't have a good answer to yet because yeah. we've not met her. She's not been um, in post long enough. And I think, to be honest, since she has been in post, all eyes have been on Ukraine. So it's yeah. very difficult to, to know how she will be any different. I, I suspect that she will be the same. Um, and you know, to be fair to James Cleverly, he was engaging. Um, he wasn't hostile, um, and he listened, and he still gave us the time. But but that doesn't change the reality, or or, the, or, the, or and, and so far hasn't changed the, the policy or the nuance. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't expect anything particularly different um, for for the engagement um, to particularly change. And I think on that point, William, let's let's bring it in. We did say quarter past at the, at the very latest. And I want to just uh, say thank you to you, first and foremost, for what was an absolutely informative and deeply insightful and and kind of opening up of uh, possibilities and visions for us. Somebody did mention earlier on that this feels like uh, such an intransigent problem, like nothing we do seems to be making a difference. Uh, but listening to you, we are making a difference, even if it mm. does take take what seems uh, um, several lifetimes. But thank you so much for the work yeah. that you do uh, um, uh, uh, for Christian Aid on behalf of all of us. We really do feel invested in the work that you do, and we want to encourage you and thank you and pray for you and 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 bless you as you continue to do it with, with your team. So can we just give a little round of applause and say thank you from everybody, please? Thank and you. But I, I just, 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 yeah. just, just to uh, to respond really quickly to that, yeah. we could only do that, and we are only as powerful as, as as our supporting churches, of which the URC for me has always been one of the most supportive. So, without without you standing with us, then you know, in a sense, I'm. It it is we we're I'm part of the we, which includes you, if if you know what I mean. So. Um, Thank you for for giving me the strength to 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 carry on as you know with and for to allowing to allow Christian Aid to do what it does because it, it wouldn't happen without all of you as well. So, okay. um, sort of I think we should congratulate um, yourselves as well. So thank you very much and thank you very much for giving me the time today. Oh, bless you and Charlotte. We want to just thank you for for the link work that you do. You are always so so happy to do what, all sorts of weird requests that we have of you. You're happy to go and do that. So we're really grateful to you. I did promise that I would I would um, give a plug for the 
uh, the URC, so Bill Kairos group, uh, who wanted to do that? I just can't see the picture right now. Did somebody yes, just want? It, it, it yes, it was me. Patricia, it that's was right. Me. I, I was in quite very early quickly and mentioned to Sabil Kairos URC support group. We'd love to see more of you join that group, and I'm sure if you contact Sabil Kairos, they can pass uh, your your names on to us because we are trying to uh, act further on the resolutions that came to assembly last year. Yeah, and you are. A